I'm very grateful to Brain Tumor Charity for inviting me today, and really it is, a, it is an honor to be here today. So the remit of my talk is to discuss with you developments in the field of neurosurgery for brain tumors, so mainly technical, and really particularly very relevant, uh, really discuss those in the context of subspecialization and also the patient experience. Okay, so, so I'm gonna quickly set the scene why brain tumors are important. I don't need to say that too much. You are all very familiar with that. Talk about recent advances and then implication of that both for the patients and also the surgeons. So even though brain tumors are uncommon, uh, less than 2% of all tumors, they are very relevant because if nothing, they are the third leading cause of cancer-related death in the younger population. The implication of that for uh, disability quality of life has already been very nicely described by Ali here. So I won't dwell on that too much. Uh, as a group, gliomas are the commonest tumors, and amongst those high-grade gliomas are probably the biggest burden that we have. So most of my talk is going to be concentrating on the gliomas, really. So why is it that as a surgeon I'm interested in brain tumors at all? It is because as a single intervention, there is no doubt that surgery has the biggest impact on the patient's survivals and probably also on their quality of life. So it's highly, highly relevant to the patient pathway and the patient journey. Unfortunately, even now, if you open any article on brain tumors, on gliomas, or any textbook, uh, it gives you the impression that at the present time, prognosis and management of glioblastoma remains extremely difficult and very poor survival, median six to nine months. Now, I'd like to say that that's not the present, that's very much the past. And I think you're moving away from this. It's extremely important to be optimistic, but if you're not, you're gonna have inertia, and inertia means there won't be any progress, there won't be any development. So you have to be optimistic. It's a challenging field, but changes that are happening which have real impact on patients' outcome. It's important that we concentrate on the positives and push forward. So what are the key advances I'm gonna discuss with you today? So image guidance, imaging is extremely important in neurosurgery, in particular neuro-oncology. Talk to you about functional imaging, talk to you about intraoperative mapping, awake craniotomies, some of the newer techniques such as fluorescent guided resection of brain tumors, intraoperative chemotherapy, and some other novel things. But really, I think the most important advancement in the recent decade has been the change in the management attitude, the philosophy how we care for these patients, which has really made the biggest, biggest impact. Okay, so what is the modern surgical attitude? It is to go for radical resection where possible, radical resection. We have moved away from the pessimistic view that, well, actually, it's a brain tumor, we might as well just do a biopsy. That, 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 that's gone. We're very much more aggressive where we can operate safely, and safe, safety matters extremely much, very much. We have to go for radical resection. So lots of papers out there on the extent of resection and survival. This is a table from a recent paper, just uh, looking through some of the larger studies. And particularly, if you look at the uh, uh, bottom and the third bottom study, where we have a large number of patients, over 400 patients, you see that's where the data indicates that, yes, if you have radical resection, you're going to significantly improve the survival of the patients. And it seems that 98% is the level of resection you need to go for. So it's less than 98% resection. It's debatable whether there's a huge impact, but certainly if you can achieve over 98% resection, there seems to be good data to support that your survival is going to be improved. So it's really worth going for. But I guess the proof of the pudding is actually intraoperative mapping of the tumor. So all those preoperative measures, as I said to you, help consent, help you plan, but actually proof of the pudding is to be able to do intraoperative physiology. So as you're operating in real time, a bit like real, uh, in, a bit like intraoperative MRI scanner, this is intraoperative physiological measurement, if you like. So real time, as you remove a tumor, you can map, map again, map again, remove map until you are happy that you're not actually risking the patient and you're having maximal, maximum resection of the tumor. So we can do this intraoperative physiology either awake or asleep. When I first started doing this kind of surgery, i.e. surgery for tumors in the eloquent part of the brain, eloquent motor part of the brain, I used to do all my cases awake because I wanted to be able to stimulate, assess the patient, and if there was no deficit, resect and repeat the procedure. But then we started working with some very good interoperative neurophysiologists, and we managed to be able to get the same good results even with patients sleep. So we could assess and the integrity and the, uh, continuity of these motor circuits even under general anesthesia. So I no longer do AVEC surgery for motor uh, eloquent part of the brain because we can assess the same things 
very nicely now with, uh, with intraoperative physiology with the patient's sleep. For the speech, however, we're still not quite there, so if I've got a tumor in this, near the speech area, uh, we do that awake, again, stimulate the patient, assess the speech, and resect, because we cannot get that kind of information still to date uh, on the general anesthetic, although we've got research projects that's working towards that, hopefully. And the stimulation effect that you're looking for at surgery can either be inhibitory, so you, know, you stimulate, patient's speech gets arrested, so you know that part of the brain is sacrilegious, you must not touch it, otherwise you damage the patient. Or it can be stimulatory, so you could be stimulating a part of a brain and you get a contraction. Again, you know that that's part of a motor circuit, so when you're resecting, you should try to avoid that part to reduce the risk to the patient. So if you're doing the operation asleep for motor pathways, then we have continuous monitoring of the ECOG, somatosensory evoke potentials, motor evoke potentials. If you're doing it uh, awake for a speech, then we have continuous assessments of the speech. So I've got a speech therapist in the theater, they examine the patient's speech, I stimulate, we map the relevant speech parts, we avoid the tumor, and we take a tumor. That's the way we do it. All of us have the speech therapist first. And we can stimulate both cortex and white matter the same way that we can use the, IM, the, the MRI scanner for functional MRI to look at the cortex or for white matter tracts using tractography. So similar thing to functional, but this is much more physiological. Okay, so interoperative chemotherapy, quickly gliadel. So gliadel, some of you may have heard, it's interoperative chemotherapy, uh, which, is, which we can basically can resect the tumor and fill the cavity with this, this chemical. The idea being is that when you operate on a high-grade tumor, you remove everything that you can see, but you know that there's going to be some residual cells left behind. And then you wait for three, four weeks for the wound to heal up, and then the patient starts having their adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy. But you know the tumor cells are not going to wait for you for four weeks to get hit by those. So if you can have some chemotherapy in the cavity, so it starts working and killing those residual cells until the patient is well enough to have their proper adjuvant radiotherapy and chemotherapy, then so much the better. So glidal is this, essentially, nice guidelines 10 years ago, said you can use carmostin wafers, so it's glidal wafers. The little, again, polomint, everything in neurosurgery, polomint. Polomint-shaped discs impregnated with this chemical, you line the cavity of your section, and then this will hopefully kill residual cells until patient can have the adjuvant treatment. Uh, there are few proposals. You have to have these before you can use this drug. For example, you have to remove at least 90% of a tumor because you've got a big bulk. It's not going to be, you know, it's just too much for this drug to work. No point, okay? Or you have to have no opening into the ventricles because if you do, it's going to get washed off, isn't it? It's not going to stay in the cavity. So within those provisos, you can use this. And we have used it in the selection of patients, uh, although not a huge number. And uh, we finished a trial, a uh, multi-center trial in the UK, Cambridge, us, uh, a number of other centers were involved, looking at combining the 5-ALA, the fluorescent resection, with the gliadel, uh, so-called GALA-5 study, that is just fine, almost finalized uh, that paper to be ready to, ready to be submitted, so I look forward to seeing those in print at some time. Very quickly, I probably only have time to talk about DCVAX, I probably will have to leave the genomics, everything else out, but DC wax is important because, uh, because I genuinely believe that immunotherapy is the way forward for brain tumors because I think, I think there's nothing cleverer than our own immune system to be able to cope with variations. The reason brain tumors are difficult is because they are very heterogeneous, extremely heterogeneous. No tumor is the same in two different people. Even different areas in the same tumor are not the same, okay? And the only technology we have which can cope with that amount of variation is your own immune system. Why? Because over 10 million years, it's evolved to protect you against millions of pathogens, right? So it's very clever. You can identify what's foreign and what's not foreign. So guess what? What should we do? We should prime our own immune system to attack the tumor. Hence, this individualized therapy, the so-called DCVAX. The reason I'm keen on that is because I was a European chief investigator for this trial, which we finished about, uh, I think, three, four months ago. Now we're waiting to get the follow-up data. So what's, what's the idea? The idea is that you operate on the patient, remove the patient's tumor, okay? And then you analyze that, do all sorts of preparations, and pick up all the individual antigens specific to that tumor in that patient. Then you take some of the patient's white cells, and in the white cells there's a subgroup called dendritic cells whose job is to present antigens to the rest of the immune system to prime it, okay? So you combine patient's own individualized antigens with patient's own dendritic cells, and you inject this back to the patient. And the idea is that the dendritic cell will then take those antigens of that particular patient, educate the rest of the immune system, and get the rest of the immune system to go and attack any residual tumor. So that's clever, right? So I'm just gonna sum up then. So, uh, I think 
Brain tumors are extremely challenging. Gliomas are extremely, extremely challenging. But I think in the last 10 years or so, there have been a huge number of advances which have got direct implications both for the surgeon and also for the patient. With respect to the surgeon, I think subspecialization, which is what I meant to be talking about, is not emerging, isn't it? Because I've shown you how difficult, how complicated, how many tools we have in order to operate on the patients for brain tumor. You cannot be a general neurosurgeon and do everything and do all these as well. It's not going to be possible. Nobody is that clever. Don't let them fool you, right? In order to have all this knowledge, or to be able to use all these techniques, you need to subspecialize. So I dread that still in this day and age in the UK, there are centers where pretty much everybody does everything. They're not subspecialized. You cannot expect to get that kind of outcome if everybody does everything, because you cannot become master if you're doing absolutely everything. So you've got to subspecialize, and the current thinking is that if you're operating on brain tumor patients, then 50% of your work as a surgeon should be dedicated to this area, and the other 50% can be anything else. But you need to be involved. We cannot do 10 different things all at the same time. The implications for the patient, I think all this technology are improving both survival and also the quality of life. Quality of life is a much bigger challenge. Okay? I hope all this technology reduces the risk of surgery and therefore less deficits, better quality of life. But because of everything that Addy said today, quality of life is very, very difficult to measure. If we published this paper ourselves a couple of years back, looking at the neurobehavioral changes following brain tumors. And you know, there are a lot. There are lots of things I cannot monitor for. I can monitor for motor function, visual function, speech function. I cannot monitor for all the psychological stress, anxiety, everything else. I cannot do that as a surgeon. Okay? So those are all very difficult. And in fact, the conclusion here was that a lot of these patients, irrespective of the location of a tumor, because we often think temporal and frontal lobe tumor have a lot more psychological issues, anxiety issues, but actually, in our paper, it didn't seem to be. I mean, patients with brain tumors have a lot of issues with behavior, psychology, etc., and they need support. So these are much, this is a much harder problem. So just to end then, I think surgical technology has advanced a lot. I think, I hope I've shown you some of those. There's a lot more I could have said, but time was limited. There's still much room for progress, though, and also surgery alone is, is, is not sufficient, nowhere near. It's only one small part of the whole jigsaw. And we need to work together to try to improve the care of our patients. And I think improving survival for me is a challenge, but I think the much bigger challenge is optimizing the quality of life of the patient. So in a way, I feel like a fraud is standing here, because actually you guys are the ones who are dealing with the quality of life issues, and it's much more relevant. Your job is much higher than mine, but uh, I happen to have the invitation to come up. All right. <laughs> so I'd just like to end here, and this is a spectrum of the King's Health Partners, so these are all the various centers that uh, we work at, and neurosurgery is sitting here in the middle, at Denmark Hill campus. Lots of our labs are in, in Guy's, uh, you know, St. Thomas's, where oncology sits, and uh, yeah, just a bunch of hospitals calling themselves King's Health Partners. Thank you very much. Big thank you to Ash. <laughs>